Welcome to my June and July wrap up where I tell you all about the books that I've read in the past two months. I review them and I rate them on a scale of one star to five stars. In the past two months, I read nine books. I have eight of them here and it really doesn't feel significant until you stack them all up and then try to hold them up. I read nine books. I have eight of the physical copies because the ninth book that I read this month is an audiobook and I'll tell you about that one too. The first book I read in this wrap up is As Good as Dead by Holly Jackson. This is a young adult thriller slash murder mystery trilogy and this is the last book in the series. If you're unfamiliar with this series, it follows Pippa Fitzgerald. She gets inspired to research a murder that happened in her town and through her research for her senior capstone project and through her research she starts to find that certain details aren't adding up and she starts to think that that the person that is said to have done the murder might have been framed by someone else. So she starts to research that in the first book. The second book, it gets a little darker. Um, she starts researching, finding her friend's older brother who was kidnapped, and then she starts a podcast as well. This one is a lot darker, but it's still young adult. She's really struggling with mental health issues after all of the trauma that she endured in the first and second book because while it's true crime and pretty violent it also is surrounding all of the people that she grew up with and she trusts so that has seriously messed with her head this book follows pippa and it kind of is a reversal because in the first two books she saw a victim and either a kidnapper or a murderer and she was the one investigating trying to help. This one is completely flipped because she is now the victim of stalking. But it's a new adventure for Pippa and Ravi because in the first two books she was the one trying to help others and now she's the one who has to investigate and research to save her own life. It takes a wild turn halfway through the book and it really shows just how smart and resourceful both Pippa and Ravi are. I thought this book was great. I gave it a five stars because I thought it perfectly summed up the entire series and the entire trilogy and I think it was a great note to end on. As Good as Dead, I gave five stars. The second book I read was Addicted for Now by Krista and Becca Ritchie. This is an interconnected romance series. It follows three different couples. The couple center around three sisters. You have Rose Calloway, Lily Calloway, and Daisy Calloway. The first three books are mainly following Lily and her romance with her um, love interest Lo, but then you get little um, snippets of romance happening between Lily and Connor and Daisy and Reich. So this is called the Addicted series because the main plot point is that it's two people both battling addiction while being in love with each other and trying to support each other and not enable each other. I liked the first one. I really liked Ricochet, which is more of a filler novel, so a lot of people didn't really like it, but I actually liked Ricochet. This one was very much a disappointment. I found myself skimming a lot of it. Lily and Lo, I still love them. Rose is probably my favorite character. Um, I loved Rose and Connor. I love their dynamic. It's the Daisy and Reich that I really can't get on board with, and I know that they get their own series. I know that Rose and Connor get their own book, and then Reich and Daisy get their own book in the Addicted slash Callaway series. I know it's something that like a lot of people love, but I just can't get on board with Daisy and Reich. Daisy is 16, and Reich, I believe, is 24. And it's just weird. The age gap is odd. Like, and they keep trying to stress that like, oh, she's mature for her age, but that's like something that, you know, predators say. <laughs> and it's weird to everyone. Reich and Daisy know that it's odd, but then Reich gets angry whenever Lo or Lily have a completely normal reaction. When Lily or Lo are either like, hey, can you stop flirting with my 16 year old sister? He gets so angry and so irrationally mad at them being like I'm not doing anything wrong yes you are you're flirting with a child you're flirting with an underage girl and am I supposed to feel any sympathy for right because I don't because you know it's what you're doing if you don't want to get yelled at for flirting with a 16 year old don't flirt with a 16 year old I really hope that Daisy turns 18 by her book because I just, I can't get on board with Daisy and Reich the way that they are. And Reich needs to take some sort of accountability for what he's doing. Because I know the forbidden love thing is supposed to work for their romance. But Reich not taking any accountability for flirting with an underage girl, it's just weird. I'm really not a fan of age gap romances whatsoever. So I really don't know how I'm going to feel about Daisy and Reich. The Reich and Daisy dynamic really brought this book down for me. The plot really was odd. Because there was an interesting plot, Lily and Lo were being blackmailed in this book, which was interesting, but we would get a chapter focused on trying to find the person that was blackmailing them, and then we would get five chapters of them just like hanging out and pretending like nothing's wrong. And the pacing was so odd for me. So because of that, and like, this book can be like 200 pages shorter in my opinion. So 
I ended up giving this book two stars because by the end I was just praying that I was going to get done with it so I can move on to the next book and it really was it's definitely my least favorite in the series so far. So Addicted After All I gave two stars. After that I read the book that I actually wrote a college essay on without reading which is Light Lark by Alex Astor. Uh, you might ask, Emma, how would you write a college essay on this book without even reading it? Well, because it wasn't about the book, it was about the controversy surrounding the book. Alex Astor blew up on TikTok promoting this book because she said that she, you know, pulled herself out of poverty. She went from, you know, barely making ends meet to, you know, and being a no-name author to being all of a sudden publishing a book, finding a publisher, selling millions of copies, selling, uh, and then signing a movie deal rights that like gave her a million dollars, like this big thing, right? And she also popularly posted her entire book trying to sell it, but just with cliche tropes over and over and over again, instead of actually talking about the plot of her book. And so then there's a lot of controversy when people started researching her and she kind of let people believe that she was a debut author and in fact this is not her first book she published a duology years and years ago which isn't technically a lie but she didn't tell the total truth which really hurt her reputation with people additionally she let people think that she was kind of like a struggling artist when in all actuality she was born to a very wealthy family she went to duke university she graduated she has zero student debt because her parents paid for it which there's nothing wrong with that but don't let your audience believe that you are a struggling artist coming from nothing to now this like Cinderella story when you never were Cinderella. You know, you were you were rich and you got richer, which there's nothing wrong with that. But she is very calculated with her social media and that's what people didn't like. So I didn't write the essay judging her. I wrote the essay talking about the controversy and the role of social media in marketing. And that was my freshman year of college. I'm going into my junior year of college, but my freshman year, this was all over my For You page because everyone was so upset about not the lies that Alex Astor told, but the misconceptions that she led everyone to believe. Um, that being said, didn't even finish this book. Did not even get to 100 page. I do not recommend this book whatsoever. Do not buy this book. I like, I usually am like, oh, like to each their own. Like, you know, everyone just has different book taste. This is genuinely a bad book. This is not a book that she wrote because she had a story to tell. This is very much like, it just feels cheap. It feels like a cash grab. It feels like the commentary that everyone has about, you know, the TikTok tropification of books where it's like you don't have a genuine story. You don't have a genuine lesson that you want to share with people. You just see like, oh, enemies to lovers, um, tension, I'm gonna grab this cliche and this cliche and this cliche and this works and like oh I'm gonna steal this concept from Hunger Games and I'm gonna steal this concept from this famous book and this concept from A Court of Thorns and Roses and it becomes cheap and it works sometimes with a few books but this one like, I could just see through it. Additionally the writing was just bad like even if the plot wasn't bad the writing was bad to the point where I was like this should not be on a bookshelf like the editor did Alex Astor dirty by not correcting it like this book had potential but it really needed to go through a couple rounds of editing like I don't think she took any of the notes from her editor and she just like pushed out the first copy that she wrote the main character felt vapid her best friend I didn't feel any chemistry there and then the whole like enemies to lovers thing with Grimm is the male love interest name. The enemies to lovers with Grimm is so just for the trope because they don't really have any reason to hate each other and I don't feel the hate for each other whatsoever. She's just like, oh, I want there to be tension so I'm gonna pretend like they're enemies. But they're really not because he's nice to her from the get-go. And then she is doesn't really have any real motivation and you can tell from the get-go that he's just like insta-lovey with her. There's no tension there's no chemistry even like it's enemies to lovers but in chapter five they're eating chocolate together like what that doesn't make any sense one star out of five dnf did not like this did not finish it but after that disappointing book we followed it up immediately with a five star read from me gods and monsters by shelby maharan this was the month of just finishing all of the series that i was in the middle of because this is the third book in the serpent and dove series and it ties up the whole series absolutely perfectly I love this book. I think that a lot of the plot points are very original. This follows um, Lou, who is a witch, who through 
certain events that are kind of hard to explain, she's forced into marrying a witch hunter named Reed. Reed is unaware that she is a witch, so the entire marriage she's trying to hide it from him. And then when he eventually finds out, he's forced to choose between his wife that he's slowly falling in love with versus the order of witch hunting, which he's dedicated his whole life to. Um, it's kind of set in 18th century France, which I think is really fun because the witch hunting is very much motivated by religious reasons, which in the 18th century France, like religion and politics and the monarchy were very much tied together. But you're not only fighting the witch hunters because they're also fighting the witches as well because Lou's mother is trying to kill her. So it's just like they're fighting against the entire world. Um, she also has her best friend Cosette Coco. I loved Coco. Um, I loved her romance with Bo, the prince. I can't give too much of this away without spoiling it, but I thought the plot points were very original and um, it looks very long, but it actually went by pretty fast. I gave this five stars. I would highly, highly recommend the entire trilogy because I actually gave the entire trilogy five stars. Through the course of this month, I've realized that there's one trope that I'm always going to fall for, and that is witch having a romance with a witch hunter. I am always, always going to fall for that. And the next book is a perfect example of how I'm falling for that story every single time. And that is Heartless Hunter by Kristen Kikarelli. I don't know how to say that. I'm sorry if I mispronounced it. Anyway, this book, if I could give it six stars, I would. I loved this book. This is a witch, witch hunter romance. And it is um, a modern adaptation of The Scarlet Pimpernel. So you have that, but also I think that it reminded me a lot of the story of Anastasia because the world that we're in, it used to be ruled by witches and they treated the common people terribly just like um, the Romanov family of Russia did to the Russian citizens. So all of the humans got together to form the blood guard, they rose up, they overthrew the witches, but they didn't just stop there, they completely outlawed the existence of witches and they immediately um, took back their freedom from the oppressors and then started committing genocide because that's logical. So they start doing executions, public executions, of every single witch that they could find. Our main character throughout this book is Rune Winters. She is the great granddaughter of a witch. She is respected by society because she told on her grandmother and she like told the whole world like my grandmother's a witch, like go kill her, but she kept the secret that she was a witch. Um, and she lives with that guilt throughout the whole book, but really her grandmother told her, like, I'm gonna get found out, you need to rat on me so that people don't think that you're a witch. And so she's forced into doing this, and so then the entire world respects her for ratting out her grandmother and turning in her grandma, but really it's one of the traumas that, like, deeply resonates with her and the guilt that she carries throughout this whole book. Rune Winters, not only is she a secret witch, but she's also the Crimson Moth which is The Crimson Moth, I believe, is the name of this book in like the UK and England, but it's changed to Heartless Hunter in the US. I'm not sure why. She's The Crimson Moth, which is this um, unknown identity kind of vigilante who runs around this kingdom and um, saves all the witches that are about to be executed, and then she ships them off on ships that she owns for like trading reasons because she's an aristocrat and she has money. But um, the captain of the guard, Gideon Sharp, then finds out that the witches that have been leaving the island are leaving on ships owned by her. So now he has reason to believe that she either is the Crimson Moth or she is aiding the Crimson Moth. So Gideon Sharp now needs to get closer to her. Rune Winters can't find a certain witch that has already been taken by the Blood Guard, so she decides that she needs to get closer to Gideon Sharp to find that information. So they both start a fake courtship, but they let the other one believe that they're actually in love with each other. But they're both flirting with each other because they're trying to get information out of each other. And it's like, this post-revolution world that reminds me so much of the story of Anastasia and the Romanov family, like the play Anastasia um, or the movie. It reminds me so much of that because it's so much like aristocracy but also like post-revolution politics. I absolutely loved this. I loved their dynamic. Um, the romance, I really felt it. Uh, there's a cute little love triangle, but like a love triangle done well between Gideon's little brother Alex and Rune. His little brother Alex is in love with Rune, and then Rune starts his courtship with Gideon, so then Gideon has his guilt because he's like, you know, I have to get close to her, but like, you know, my, you know, my little brother's in love with her, but he can't work up the courage to tell her. 
I absolutely loved Alex in this. He's my little baby. Gideon, I adored him. And then Rune, I think she's an amazing main character. Um, I have to wait so long for the second book in the series to come out. And this ended on such a good cliffhanger. The plot twist in the last 100 pages is insane. I didn't see that coming at all. And I'm really good at guessing plot twists. But I absolutely love this book. If there was only one book that you go out and buy after watching this video, it has to be Heartless Hunter. Six stars. The next book I read was Restore Me by Tahira Mafi. My favorite part about this book is literally the cover. Um, 200 pages of this book can just be gone and it is the same exact story. It's the fourth book in the Shatter Me series and it is such a filler novel. But we have our main character Juliet. She just overthrew the reestablishment of North America. And all she does is just stand around all day and everyone complains to her that she's not a good leader and she doesn't know anything. And instead of like asking questions, she's like, yeah, I don't know anything. I'm just so bad at this job. And then they just talk, they constantly talk every single day how busy they are and they have no time and they have so much to do, but then the author doesn't tell us anything what they're doing. Like Warner reads files for like a chapter and that's it. Like they're like, oh, we're so busy. We have so much to do. What are you doing? You're just standing around and complaining the entire book. First 150 pages, nothing good actually happens until we get introduced to a new character. The plot doesn't even start until Nazira shows up. Nazira's a new character and she's by far the best part of the whole book. So Nazira shows up, she's the daughter of one of the other commander's kids and um, she's far and away the best part of the book and she's only in a few scenes. The dynamic between Nazira and Kenji I think is really cute so far. I think you'll get more of that in the fifth and sixth book. But um, basically Nazira shows up, we get like three other plot points but it is so stretched out and so pointless. I liked the plot, but there was just so much filler and so much that I had to skim in this book that I really, it took away from it, especially in the beginning, the first 200 pages. They're just sitting around and complaining and I'm like, oh my god, just do something then. Anyway, uh, I gave this book three stars though because I still like the series, I still like where the story's going, it just, this was poorly executed, but I still gave it three stars out of five. Sticking with the Shatter Me universe, I read a novella that I was actually supposed to read between the first and second book, but I forgot I had it, and that is Unite Me. Unite Me is a novella combined of Destroy Me and Fracture Me. Destroy Me is from Warner's POV, and then Fracture Me is from Adam's POV. Um, Warner is one of my favorite characters, and I liked actually exploring his headspace between book one and book two, because book two was when I started to actually like Warner. Book one, I hated him. And then I liked reading Fracture Me as well, because it was from Adam's point of view. Adam is a character that you're supposed to technically hate because of his falling out with Juliet, but I really love and appreciate his dynamic with his little brother James. And I thought that was so cute, and the novella really explores his dynamic protecting his little brother. And I really think that Adam as a character, he was written to be a protector of his little brother first, and it's so obvious that James is his number one, so a romance between him and Juliet really never would have worked out, even if Adam didn't kind of turn the way he did, but it never would have worked out because James is always going to be his number one priority, which I think it should because, you know, that's his family. I don't hate Adam as a lot of other book readers of this series do, but I kind of still love Adam. Um, but yeah, I really enjoyed this novella, so I gave it um, four stars out of five. It was a quick, easy read, and it was a good POV into other characters that I like to explore. After that, I picked up a romance book, trying to switch gears, and I picked up the Mistake by L. Kennedy. This is the second book in the off-campus series. It's a hockey romance set in college. This book is actually crazy because I didn't actually read the back of it when I bought it. I bought it like two years ago, I think. And I just kept putting it off because I didn't think that it was going to be very good because I didn't like The Deal, which is the first book in the series. And I bought this with The Deal, so I was like, I'm just going to keep pushing it back to the back of my TBR list because I really didn't want to pick it up because I was afraid that I wasn't going to like it, just like I didn't like the deal. But then I read the back and I was like, okay, this is kind of crazy because the male love interest has the same name and is in the same year of college as my current boyfriend. And then the main character in this has my middle name and then is also in the year of college that I was in whenever I met my boyfriend. It's John Logan, but everyone calls him Logan whenever he's a junior. And then we follow Grace when she's a sophomore. It's called The Mistake because it follows a little romance between Logan and Grace. They meet, they have instant chemistry, they have a lot of really cute scenes together, and then the problem with Logan is that he's still in love with his 
best friend's girlfriend from The Deal. The Deal follows Garrett and Hannah. Garrett and Hannah begin dating at the end of the book, and the problem with Logan is he starts falling in love with Hannah, or so he thinks. And so then that kind of throws him off, and he can't really get into a relationship when he still feels like he has feelings for this other girl. Which I really thought I was going to hate. I was like, I don't want to read a book about a guy being in love with another girl and then getting involved with another girl. But it turns out that he's not really in love with Hannah for what she is, because Hannah's not really his type. He's jealous of Hannah and Garrett because they have a relationship, and he's never had a relationship. So he couldn't really articulate his own feelings like every man in college can't but he couldn't really figure out that he wasn't jealous of Garrett for dating Hannah he was jealous of Garrett for having a girlfriend so then he realizes that he's pushed Grace away whenever he actually wants a relationship with her and so then he spends the entire book trying to make up for this mistake and going to like embarrassing lengths for Grace which I loved I need the male love interest in a book to be more in love with the girl than the girl is in love with the guy because I love watching the effort that he goes through to win her back and I think it's so cute. It was kind of giving like almost like a 2000s rom-com and I I loved Logan in this book. I thought he was very sweet. He was a little dumb but he was very sweet. Um, I loved how much he pined and fought for Grace and I actually really respected Grace in this book because she didn't just give in immediately. She had a lot of like strength and like self-respect and standards so i actually liked this book so much more than i actually thought i was going to so i gave this four stars out of five the last book that i read for this wrap up is daughter of no world i listened to this on audiobook it follows tasana who is a former slave she attempts to buy her freedom from her slave master and whenever that doesn't go well she um, ends up accidentally killing him so then she flees in the middle of the night leaves the country and goes to an organization that she thinks is going to bring freedom to the other slaves in her homeland she goes to an organization called the orders because they are the orders of midnight and daybreak i believe she has magic herself but it's all very limited from because she's just very ignorant on how to use magic so she goes there hoping to learn more so that she can become more powerful and then go back and free the friends that she made in slavery and free everyone else obviously but they're like okay the only guy that we the only person that can really train you is this one really really grumpy guy and then we're introduced to max who becomes her love interest um max at first is so uninterested in training tasana he really doesn't care but over the course, she kind of wears him down. They start training. It really takes a turn whenever Tasana volunteers to be this like experiment in the army of the orders to be like possessed by this like magical thing that they don't really understand. Um, Max was formerly possessed by it and that's why he hates people and he hates the orders because he sees, because he saw the dark side of whatever this thing is that possesses Tizana and Tizana volunteers to be possessed by it because the only way that she can get the orders to help free her people is if she volunteers for this like evil kind of ghost slash force thing that gives her a more magical abilities but also kind of possesses her. <laughs> it's hard to explain but that was a very interesting plot point and it was very original. It's not something that I'd really heard of before. It was a really good book all in all, so I gave it uh, 4.5 stars out of 5. Alright, and those are all of the books I read in the months of June and July. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you guys next time I post.